thank you all so very much for coming. My name is Lennox Hoyt, and I'm a urogynecologist. Uh, that means that I'm a, not a European gynecologist, but <laughs> a, uh, a gynecologist, OBGYN specialist with extra training in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery, cocktail party languages, if it's falling out, leaking, or hurting, and it's female, between the <laughs> belly button and the upper thighs, that's what I look after. Um, and it allows me to say gently what I do without embarrassing my wife, children, or dear friends, and other teenagers. Anyway, bladder control problems. I'm going to talk about the symptoms, the diagnosis, and management. I like to start with questions, okay? These are the questions that patients ask us when they come to us. It seems like I have to urinate more often than I used to. I thought I had a bladder infection, but all the tests keep coming back negative. It feels like I cannot fully empty my bladder. Even if I just went to the bathroom, I feel like I have to go again. I'm having uh, to get up more often at night to urinate. I have trouble holding on to my urine. Whenever I get the urge to urinate, whenever I get home and I'm trying to get out of the car, whenever I put the key in the keyhole, I get an urge and I leak before I go to the bathroom. I leak urine whenever I cough, laugh, sneeze, lift heavy objects, or change positions. I'm resonating here, it sounds like. I'm worried that the problem will get worse. I'm worried it could be a serious life-threatening problem. I was told, this is my favorite, that live with it, honey, these are part of symptoms of natural aging. Well, I want you to know that the symptoms of overactive bladder, urinary incontinence, are experienced by many women. They affect 25%, maybe more, of women over 65, 30% of women over 60, and the one that got me was that 50% of nursing home patients, fem the female, are put there because of bladder control issues. They're usually not life-threatening. They can significantly decrease quality of life, uh, many affected women fear leakage, stop most activities outside of the home, learn the locations of the bathroom along the routes that they travel normally and only go to those places where they can get between the bathroom. If their time is 20 minutes, the bathrooms have to be 20 minutes apart or else they ain't going. So the problems can also be expensive. This data is old, adult diapers, 75 cents to a buck each, four diapers a day, $3 a day, $90 a, a month. Uh, starts adding up after a while. The symptoms can be worse with age, but they're not normal, and they can usually be treated. So today, what I'm going to do is talk about the symptoms, causes, diagnosis, the treatment uh, for bladder control problems. I'm going to try to go kind of quickly. So let's start with what's going on there. What I find with most patients when they come is they understand a lot about their cars and their refrigerators and their homes and their drills and tools and things. Don't know much about the anatomy. So here's a quick anatomy lesson. Here is a woman facing us. Right above, at, at the nipple line, just beneath that are the kidneys. There's one on either side. The kidneys drain urine from the blood, and they drain it into the bladder, which sits down here in the pelvis, just above that pubic bone. The bladder is connected to the outside through the urethra. Bladder is a muscle. The urethra is controlled by a muscle. When you're sitting here listening to my talk, uh, the bladder muscle is relaxing and the urethral sphincter is tightening. That keeps urine in. When you go someplace that's private and you and your bladder agree that you want to empty, this muscle uh, here relaxes, the gate, if you will, opens, and the bladder muscle contracts to push urine out. Urine is not an activity that you engage in like running or jumping or hiking. You've got to sit down and say, ah, I'm ready. And that activity then sends complex signals down to the bladder, the smooth muscle bladder that starts contracting uh, uh, to push the urine out. All right, so here's a side view of that same woman. She's looking this way. Here's belly button right around here. Here's pubic bone. Right under the pubic bone is the bladder, that muscle we talked about. Here's the urethra. Right underneath that is the vagina. The vagina is like a trampoline. It holds the bladder in place. It's stretched off from the left side of the pelvis to the right side, stretched off like a long tube, like a sock. It holds the bladder up like this, and it keeps the rectum in place. You can see the rectum behind. What happens when you do exactly what you just did, a cough, is that cough pressure hits here, and some of it gets to the urethra. So there's no change in pressure between the bladder and the urethra when you cough like that, provided the vagina is good and supportive. Sometimes what can happen, mostly after childbirth, is that this vagina will, having stretched in childbirth, Patty, Patty knows about that, Greg's delivered a few babies, so have I, uh, this tissue can stretch quite dramatically. It doesn't always come back to where it started out. 
So now here's a cough coming along, and it pushes on the bladder here. It also pushes on the vagina. It kind of gives way and doesn't allow the urethra to contract. So that's when that pressure in the bladder pushes out and actually shows up as urine leakage. That's called stress incontinence. The other type of a way to leak is to actually have the bladder muscle not listen to your brain. There's a tight dialogue going on between brain and bladder at all times. <laughs> and you'll know this because when we start talking about bladders, the bladder notices. And so you better know where the bathroom is once you start talking about bladders. <laughs> it's right around the corner to the left. It's the second door on the left after the opening. Okay? So the normal dialogue between brain and bladder is bladder says, We've delivered babies, we've seen babies. Baby's bladder is full, baby's bladder empties. Baby's bladder is full, baby's bladder empty. Baby's not in that. Baby's crying, doing whatever. Bladder full, bladder empty. As we grow up, we gain more control. We have a signal coming from the back of the brain, the pontine maturation center, that sends the signals down to the bladder that says, yeah, I know you gotta go, but I'm busy. You can't, right? That's called an inhibitory signal. And so normally as you're sitting there, your bladder is filling up and you're saying to yourself, you know what, the guy's still interesting, he's kind of weird, but interesting, I want to hear what he's got to say. <laughs> That's an inhibitory signal. Most of the time that works. Overactive bladder occurs when that inhibitory signal from the brain stops working to slow the bladder down. That's called urgent continence or overactive bladder. So you get like a baby again. Bladder's full, bladder's empty. Bladder's full, bladder's empty. And so that's considered uh, what's called overactive bladder or urgent continence. Sometimes you're able to hold on and keep the urine in. Then you have that sense of urgency all the time. You don't leak, but you have this urge like you have to go all the time. That's also a form of overactive bladder, sometimes called dry overactive bladder because you don't leak as opposed to wet. So the symptoms of bladder control problems include frequency and urgency. Nocturia here is when you're getting up at night to urinate. Most people consider one to twice at night normal. If you're doing it more than that, that's considered uh, abnormal, and it's called nocturia. Urinary incontinence, involuntary leakage of urine, which is what that is, incomplete bladder emptying. Frequency, defined as need to urinate more than about 10 times a day. I get a lot of patients, mostly uh, labor and delivery nurses, doctors, airline pilots, those kinds of people that say to me, doc, I've got a strong bladder. I only go once a day. Bad bladder. You're supposed to be voiding about eight to 10 or 12 times a day, that's considered normal. You want to keep the bladder empty, you want to keep the urine flowing. We all have urgency, but we're able to suppress the urge. We define urgency here as a persistent need to void that you can't suppress. Nocturia we talked about, and in some rare cases, uh, we have women with incomplete bladder emptying, a sense that the bladder is always full. Just went to the bathroom, you still feel like you have to go. We talked about the two types of incontinence, Stress incontinence is when the uh, cough, laugh, leak type incontinence. The urge incontinence is the gotta go, gotta go, leak before I get there incontinence uh, that we talked about also. And overflow incontinence is a special uh, type. There's a lot of women that have uh, bladder surgeries for one reason or another. The bladder surgery interrupts the flow of urine. The bladder can't empty well, so the bladder remains in a state of fullness. So whenever that extra two drops of urine shows up, they leak again. That's called overflow incontinence. Causes. So when you have symptoms of bladder control problems, you want to make sure there's not a urinary tract infection. That's the most common cause. Other causes have to do with, as we get older, and Dr. Wilkerson will talk about uh, menopause in the question and answer section, uh, vagina is very sensitive to estrogen, so is the bladder. With aging, uh, women get older, the levels of estrogen fall, the bladder and the vagina get irritated. These can lead to bladder control symptoms. Vaginal childbirth is a risk factor for reason we talked about. Prolapse, you know, as we all get bigger than we need to be uh, here in America, that's also a risk factor. Act act activities that involve, was that kind and polite? That was good, right? Yeah. Um, occupations that involve heavy lifting or straining, if you're lifting heavy things. Uh, some women that do parachute jumping will have uh, issues uh, like that here. Other causes include medications. People that take diuretics, hydrochlorothiazide, uh, Lasix, those kinds of medications, sedatives, tranquilizers, uh, some antihypertensives uh, will uh, put you at risk for the problem. If you had prior pelvic or incontinence surgery, prolapse repair surgery, urinary incontinence surgery, bladder slings, suspensions, butchers, and such, and women with neuromuscular disorders, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, stroke, spinal cord injury, 
interrupts that signal that comes from the brain to the bladder, that inhibitory signal gets messed with in people with neuromuscular disorders. All right, medical problems like diabetes, inability to get around, you want to go to the bathroom, the urge is there, you can't get there fast enough, uh, that could be an issue. Women who are demented, um, you know, have the urge, can't tell that it's an urge and not interpret it uh, correctly. Excessive fluid intake is what I see from time to time. Uh, the word is you know, 96 ounces of water a day. That's probably a little bit too much for most of us. It's probably more like 40 ounces a day because you get most of it from the food that you eat. Rare cause of bladder control issues is bladder cancer. It's less than 1%. It's extremely rare. It's not the thing I want you to worry about, but I want you to be aware that if you end up coming to myself or Dr. Wilkerson for bladder control issues, way in the back of our minds, we're going to be thinking, okay, well, if our stuff doesn't work, we better get you worked up uh, and make sure that you don't have bladder cancer. What I look at, symptom medical history, I want to test your urine in the office quickly to make sure there's not a bladder infection. The examination is pretty straightforward. It's a gynecologic exam. I stand off to the side. I ask you to cough while you're lying down. I stand off to the side because I don't want to get wet, <laughs> and I have been wet. If there's a medical student or somebody that I don't like in the room, I'll have them stand in front of the patient, okay? Um, and if you see that gush of fluid uh, with the cough, uh, that's usually a giveaway that something's up. Examine for pelvic and bladder masses. Needless to say, one time I found a basketball in the, bla in the uh, pelvis that was the cause of the urinary incontinence. We got rid of the fibroid and uh, the patient got cured. Vaginal atrophy from aging. And the thing that I want you to be aware of, because we don't usually think of those things, is pelvic muscle trigger points. Now, you ever heard about the headache in the pelvis? Pelvic pain, a headache in the pelvis. Little do they know how key that is. Migraine headaches a lot of times have to do with tension and muscle spasm. Very often, women with overactive bladder type symptoms in the pelvic floor will have a collection of symptoms including pain with attempts at intercourse, uh, pain at rest, and the overactive bladder. When I examine those patients and I touch the Kegel muscles or the pelvic floor muscles, I'll find those women go, ouch, that makes me want to pee. It turns out that the muscles in the pelvic floor that you do your Kegels with have an intimate interaction with the brain as well and are really good at convincing the brain that the bladder is full. So if those muscles are injured for one reason or another, you'll have a sense that you have to urinate a lot. So one of the things that I look for in my exam is, what is those pelvic muscle trigger points. If we find them, then I'll have you be treated by a physical therapist. And lo and behold, L large tracts of those women with pelvic muscle trigger points will get cured of their bladder symptoms if those trigger points are recognized. I don't want you to think anything weird if you go to Dr. Wilkerson and he says you have trigger points in your pelvic floor, you have to go to a pelvic floor physical therapist who will put their fingers in your vagina and work on your pelvic floor muscles. <laughs> he is not crazy, okay? It actually works and there's a lot of science behind why it works and there's a lot of evidence that says that it works extremely well. Okay? All right. Uh, Post-void residual, I want to know how well your bladder is emptying. Uh, voiding diary, uh, I have you sometimes fill out a diary saying all of the times you've voided, how much and such. There are esoteric tests like pad tests. I'll have you wear a pad. I'll give you a medication that turns the urine orange. I'll have you run around for the day and I'd look at the pad uh, to see if there's any leakage of urine. Turns out we can get pretty sophisticated information from that. Beyond that, there's uh, bladder testing, urodynamics is what it's called, which I can explain if you want. Cystoscopy, that rare chance of bladder cancer, we want to be able to look in the bladder and make sure there are no tumors or abnormalities there that will lead to that, okay? Um, how do we treat them? For women with urine, urinary frequency, urgency, nocturia, um, pelvic muscle physical therapy, I talked about bladder retraining. Amazingly, if you and the bladder, the brain and the bladder, develop a good relationship, you can actually get the bladder to behave better. It's called time voiding. The British invented it, go figure. Uh, they get you in the hospital and they'd have you on a voiding schedule. First two weeks, void every 30 minutes, whether you need it or not. Second two weeks, void every 45 minutes. Third week, void every one hour. They can get you up to two to three hours. It works about half the time. My question is, which woman in America has got time to void for every hour for the next two weeks. So about 55% loss rate when you try to do that, but if you do it, it, it works nicely. There's medications that we can give you. Used to be there was one set of medication, gave you dry mouth and constipation. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Most women stopped. Uh, they got better and better over time. 
better and better, more expensive, $12 on the low end per month, $150 on the high end, same medication. Uh, there are new models now that may or may not work, that they're out there. Uh, other things include a bladder, a vaginal pacemaker. It's a little insert about this size, this round. I'm not kidding. Goes inside the vagina, sits there twice a day for 20 minutes. About 50% of those women will get cured. The other device is a bladder pacemaker. Both Dr. Wilkerson and I implant the bladder pacemaker for women with very severe overactive bladder symptoms. It works like a charm. It's amazing. Uh, it cures women with bad overactive bladder. It is in, in an implant. It, it is an implant. You're on your way to becoming bionic. So that's a big thing to think about. There's a battery. You've got to change it every five years or so. Botox injection into the bladder muscle. Got up ahead of steam some years ago. People have used it. It works nicely. Downside, sometimes your bladder gets so calm that you can't empty. Uh, the Botox wears off after three months. All right, uh, for the cough, laugh, leak type incontinence, a couple of uh, approaches, pelvic muscle exercises. Again, the physical therapist can teach that. Pessaries uh, go into the uh, vagina underneath the bladder. You can see it right here, and it helps to make this little uh, urethra close when you cough. They work about 25 to 50 percent of the time. Beyond that, there's surgery, which is designed to do the same thing. Get a shelf underneath the urethra so that when you cough, the urethra kinks and uh, prevents uh, urinary leakage. That's pretty much what's offered these days. Earlier days, there used to be other techniques, urethral bulking agents. It's like putting collagen in your lip, except you put it in the urethra. Uh, we don't do very much of those anymore. Older procedures include the birch, where there's an incision, and we string the vagina up to the pelvic bones, and mysteriously it worked, uh, and such. Over, uh, bladder control symptoms are treated, uh, usually with inner stim. This is the incomplete emptying. Correct any prolapse, pelvic floor physical therapy, bladder pacemakers. What if you choose no treatment? Whatever's happening now will continue to happen. You're not going to die from it. It's an ugly situation to have. The order of urine long term is not a pleasant one. Uh, so urine leakage can cause skin breakdown, irritation and such, small risk of bladder cancer. It's the reason why you would come to Dr. Wilkerson or myself if the problem is persistent. Let us at least have a look at you and examine you and say everything's fine.